when you're out in the woods, chances are at some point on all your adventures, you're going to have to make some repair, make a repair to your equipment or possibly make repair to even the type of rope or cordage that you use. And having the right tool for the job is going to make life a lot easier for you, but it's also going to enable you to do things that may even improve what you need. Stay with me. Thank you for joining me today on my channel as we take a look at FID and splicing. Now, before we get started, I, like I said, I want to thank you for taking the time and watching this channel, but I also want to give a shout out to my patrons on Patreon. So if that's something that you're interested in and in supporting this channel monetarily, then join our patrons on Patreon. Just check out Mr. Dyer's Musings. I also want to let you know that I have a a website called honorableoutfitters.com and all the minutia, all the historical detail and things um, and things that I can reference I just don't have the time for in my video, I put on there. So give that a check out too, honorableoutfitters.com. Okay, so generally on this channel we talk about artifacts and I try to talk about the history. Unfortunately, I have no idea when the first FID was made. Uh, I have no idea you know, what country it originated from. Uh, there, there's just not enough history that I could dig up, but I can tell you what the common group of people who used the FID. Now the FID is a tool, and generally speaking, it's a tool that's used with rope work. And the people who tend to use a lot of rope throughout human history are people that either work in the construction trades, when you think about cranes and, and machinery like that, where you have to move things, and sailors. Now today in our contemporary society, generally speaking, uh, because of our more recent history with rope and, and fibs, it, generally speaking, it relates to tall masted ships. So if you were a sailor in the 16, 17, 1800s, or even before, there's a good possibility that you were around and you probably at least used at some point a fid. Okay. Now what's the difference between a fid and a marlin spike? Well, sometimes they're kind of used synonymously, but fids are long wooden tools that are circular and they come tapered to a point, um, not a sharp point, but a gradual point. And a marlin spike is generally speaking made out of metal and the Wooden tools, the wooden fid, are used for natural stranded rope, and marlin spikes are used for wires. Now, marlin spikes were certainly used for wood rope, but traditionally, the fid is what was used for natural material three-stranded rope, whereas the marlin spike, for our most contemporary purposes, is used for metal wire and metal three-stranded three-stranded pieces of wire. There we go. Um, so the fit that I make is about eight inches long. Now, I made this mainly for the use with three eighth inch of rope and larger. Depending on the length and the diameter of fit is what you generally use the rope on. The, it's generally what you use for the rope. Now, three inch, I would generally speaking have about seven, eight inches long, and it would come to a narrower point. If you're working with larger rope, then you're going to want a wider diameter fit. So this is kind of my middle ground because I don't use anything larger than a one inch, and this will be fine for a one inch. And due to its uh, the, the length of it, if it's perfectly in my hand, it's also easily packs away in my backpack or in my box. Now, fids, if you're a sailor, it's really handmade. You got a lot of time out in the sea. 
So handcrafted goods like FIDs or even rope work went hand in hand. Uh, I made this FID for, generally speaking, the purpose of using it for rope. But due to the size of it, I also had complete intentions that it could be used for making nets, which we need an extra tool for that. We're not going to go over that in this video, maybe down the road, but that's something that you can also make rather quickly out in the woods with a little bit of time. Now deer camp takes place, generally speaking, in the cold winter months. So chances of it being wet or snowy or cold, all those are going to affect natural stranded rope because these types of ropes will absorb moisture and in freezing temperatures they get rather stiff and if you've ever been out in the winter the amount of time and your hands get kind of cold it's really difficult to manipulate rope with thick heavy gloves so you have to take your gloves off having a fid to pry open those strands or to untie knots makes your life a lot easier and it'll save the nubs of your fingers okay so making a fin, grab a piece of wood, you can carve it yourself, spend a little bit of time, personalize it, make sure it fits in your hand and it's nice and smooth. You want something that tapers gradually. Uh, generally speaking, if it's longer, you want it to have a narrower taper. If it's short and a little bit larger like this, then you're going to have to accommodate that as well. Uh, but again, just try to match the fit to the diameter of the rope. Material of wood doesn't really matter. But I can tell you that a rot resistant wood like oak, cherry, is going to be a better material than pine. Pine's going to be soft. So using, especially with thicker rope, having a softer wood is not going to be ideal. You also want to make sure it's dry wood. You don't want to use green wood. And uh, like I said, take your time, make sure it's sanded smooth. You can even use sandstone or other natural materials to sand it and prepare it. Um, but then keep it, you know, keep it in your pack, keep it in your box or uh, take it home. Depends on how much rope work you like to do. When I'm outside, I like to do some rope work. And there's some cool things you can do with it that I'm going to show you, but we're not going to discuss how to do it. All right. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do with splicing to make it handy around camp or even just for entertainment, which I'm going to give you an example of it, but we're not going to show you how to do it in this video. It'll have to be for a future one, just due to time's sake. So far, if you think that this channel's content, this video's content is of value to you, please do me a favor and go ahead and click the subscribe button. Hit the bell button, that way when new stuff comes out, then you're made aware of when it comes out. And go ahead and hit like if you like the video. That tells me that I'm doing a good job, but it also expands this out to others so other people can be helped out as well. I appreciate it. So who doesn't like free stuff? I certainly like free stuff. Everybody likes free stuff. And all you have to do for a chance to get some free items from me that are handmade, that relate to the various topics that we discuss on this channel, like artifacts, all you need to do is subscribe to my channel, like this video, and leave a comment with what you like about this video or go back and watch some of my other videos and pick one that's your favorite and let me know which one's your favorite and why. That way I can become better. You know, as a teacher, I'm a continual learner. And without your personal feedback about what you like, then I'm, I'm gonna struggle to grow a little bit. So I need your help. Now, what you're gonna win, I'm gonna give out a FID, which is relating to this video, now that you know what a FID is used for. I'm going to give you a mallet and a reproduction six inch ruler. Now, if you're interested in like, how does this relate to my channel, you're probably pretty new. Because a while ago, I did a video on a Civil War writing kit. And I showed my six inch ruler in that kit. So again, for a chance to win, all you have to do is be one of my thousand subscribers by the time this channel hits a thousand, which we're almost at 600 as of right now of me saying this, like the video and let me know what your favorite video was and why. That's it. It's pretty simple. And I get the feedback. I appreciate it.
Okay? So, don't forget that subscribe button if you find this channel of value. Let's talk about splicing. Generally speaking, when you're splicing rope, you have three types of splices that you're mostly going to use. There are others, but the three main ones are going to be your end splice, your eye splice, and your short splice. Now, we're going to show you how to do the end splice, but as an example for that, as you can see, I'm holding a rope and it's been whipped. And if you're out camp and you, know, you don't want to deal with splicing, or maybe this is just going to be a temporary thing, then having a whipped end of rope is going to contain the frayed rope, and it's going to make sure it doesn't get tangled up, and it's going to be a lot more user-friendly. I have a video of how to whip a rope, and I'll put the link right here. So after this video, if that's something you're, you don't know how to do or you'd like a refresher, go ahead and click that, and uh, it'll help you out. So if you want to make something permanent, more permanent versus a temporary thing, then you use splices. Knots are really good for temporary items. For example, you use a square knot to combine two ropes of the same diameter, but you may want to reuse that those two ropes. So using a splice doesn't really make a sense in there. Or maybe you want a loop, but again, it's just going to be temporary. Using a bowline would certainly make more sense, but if it's going to be for a permanent, reusable, a function, or maybe down the road you think you're going to reuse it time and time again, then eye splice would be beneficial. So if your rope like this, you know you're never going to, uh, you know you're going to want this thing closed, then an end splice is going to be the choice. An end splice looks like this. Now the benefits of a splicing versus a knot is that the splice is much stronger than the knots that you can tie. So that's gonna give your use a little bit more expandability, uh, especially for utility purposes, because with a knot, you're going to compromise some of the strength of the rope. That's not the way it is with a splice. So learning the skill is gonna be benefit. So this here is an end splice, and this is the one we're gonna show you in this video. This is an eye splice. As you can see, it's got a loop at the end, and you can make the loop as big as you need to. This is an eye splice. And this, to make this ring, is called a short splice. Now, the benefit of a short splice is when you join two pieces of rope together, it's really, really strong. And just like this, you can make a ring for entertainment. If you don't have horseshoes that you're going to take, making rings like this for a quick game is a lot of fun. Or maybe you need to make a handle or something else. So again, you can reuse these ideas of splices for a multitude of different things in just their practical sense. You can think outside the box and use them for alternate uses. All right, so what are you going to need to splice rope? You honestly don't need a fit, especially for a smaller rope that's three, in, three eighths an inch or maybe even an inch. But in the winter, like I said, deer camp, which is what this series is focuses on, uh, having that fit is going to be pretty useful, especially if it's really cold. So you need your piece of rope, three strand, natural rope works the best. You're going to want your fit, and you're going to want a knife. That's all you need. I'm going to Move the camera over here so I can show you how we take care and make an end splice. To start out with, you want to make sure that you cut off the end flush and make sure that any of the unraveled pieces that, like this that might be coming off, that that is done away with because you want something that you can easily work with and you don't have to fight. Then you want to want to untwist the rope about six inches for each strand. If it's a little bit more than six inches, that's fine too. So as you untwist, you have your three strands of rope. Now the first step is what's commonly called making the crown. And what we're doing here is making an end splice. So the crown is gonna be the foundation and set us off with a really good splice. You wanna take your middle rope, you're going to fold it down in front, making a loop or what kinda of looks like a P. Then you're going to take your other side rope, 
bring it in front of the P and on top of the shoulder of the rope on the other side. Then you're going to take the rope that's on the remaining, you're going to put it over the rope that crossed and through the eyelet of the P. And then you're going to bring down each rope, twisting it as you do it, making sure it's nice and tight. You're going to start with the, the rope from the P and go around each time. Again, you want to make sure that this is done right. You're going to keep twisting, make it nice and tight and clean and dressed. Just like so. Okay, now you can see if you have those three ropes each going kind of in a triangular pattern, then you're off to a great start. Okay, now I'm going to use the fit just to start out with, and then I'm going to stop using the fit because the rope is rather easily to use. It's not cold and it's not a thicker piece of rope. When you splice down, you want to splice in the direction that is opposite of the twisted rope. Since the rope is twisting that direction, we're going to splice in that direction. Remember that it's always the opposite direction from the rope's twist. To start us off, you're going to go over and under. Then you're going to turn it and you're going to go over and under. And then you're going to turn it and you're going to go over and under. Now the first wraps down are always generally the most difficult and once you get started it's easy so we're going to go over and under for that i'm going to use my fid and i'm going to push create an opening and then i'm going to twist this rope and i'm going to put it in place of the fid and push down and if i need to i can even use the fid to help push the rope this is especially useful when the rope is cold and wet. When it's been uh, out on a frozen night, it can be rather difficult to work with. Again, twisting it and pulling. Now I'm going to go over, I'm going to go under. Over and under. Twist and pull, twist and pull. I'm going to go over that rope. And this is kind of gets kind of confusing because you might be tempted to go under this rope, but this is the rope that we just put under. So we're going to go over that one and we're going to go under this one that's hiding. So twist that a little bit. Push through. You're going to pull upward. That'll help with making it nice and tight in the correct direction. And meanwhile, you're twisting the bottom part to help it stay nice and tight. Keep its shape. And there's your start. And now, just follow along, over and under. If at any point you end up with two ropes coming out of the same hole, on the same round, you know you did something wrong. But as you can see, these two are kind of peeking out, but that's just because it's in the middle of a wraparound. So if I put this one over that one and under that one, that's no longer an issue. When you're starting out and learning how to do this, that's the most common mistake is to think that you messed up when really you just have to backtrack and check the one before it. So that's why it's another reason why you always go in the same direction all the time. You don't switch it up. So we're going to go over that one and under that one. Twisting it, pulling up, make it nice and tight. Over, under. Over, under. And over, 
or under. And we're going to do one more. Because we got enough rope. Over, under. Over, under. And over, under. Again, dress it up by pulling upward and out. And they should be pretty much even if you cut it. Okay, now that still kind of looks kind of poopy. So what we're going to do to dress this up, we're actually going to rub this between our hands, or you could rub it on the board. Just rubbing it between your two hands. Help even it out. Make it look nicer, neater. It goes a long way. What that does is that evens out the twists. Of the rope, it keeps it dressed. There you have it. That is your end splice. Now, if it's really, really fuzzy, you can take a match or a, a lighter and you can burn off a little hairs, but honestly, it doesn't need to be done. And you would cut these off, but you don't want to cut them off right at the base. You want to leave a little bit of the tail out. That way it doesn't fall back inside of the splice. So again, using a cutting board, leave about a quarter of an inch to a half inch out. Like so. And you're good to go. Do that to the other two. And you got yourself an in-splice. I hope you liked this video. If you did, again, please click like. Do me that favor. It helps other people find these videos and helps the channel. And if you think it was of any value to you, please click subscribe. That way you're made aware of when all these other videos come out in the future. In future videos, I will teach you how to do the short splice and I'll also teach you how to do the ice splice, which are great tools for your toolbox when you go outdoors and if you use natural rope. And it's amazing how strong these splices are in comparison to knots. So it's just that much more beneficial for you to know how to do this. So in case you need to make a block and tackle system or something else, maybe climb down someplace, this will be stronger and remain the, maintain the integrity of the rope than your knots. So again, I give this to you as a suggestion. And I hope it's of value to you. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Give a kiss and hug to your loved ones. And I'll see you next Sunday. Take care.